You're listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. Hello, I'm Flight Lieutenant Peter Lisney, and in this episode, we'll visit RAF Cranwell and RAF Valley to hear about the military flying training system. We'll also reheat a few stories, just in case you missed them. But first, see if you can identify this noise. Find out if you're right at the end of this episode. Now, it takes years of study and training before an RAF pilot earns their coveted wings and can progress to operational flying. In episode 15, we looked at helicopter pilot training. Today, we reveal the pathway to becoming an RAF pilot flying multi-engine aircraft or jet fighters. If you're flying and you're thinking to yourself, I've got a spare couple of seconds, you're probably already behind aeroplanes. So you need to be constantly thinking ahead. It takes a lot of uh, mental capacity and preparation to be able to um, prosecute the targets. The instructor is creating simulated uh, surface to a missile threat that the student has to respond to and still hit his or her target on time to a second. I'm Group Captain Jonathan Nixon. I am the Commandant of Number 3 Flying Training School here at RAF Cranwell. So the UK Military Flying Training System is a partnership with uh, Ascent, our training service provider, in delivering flying training for the whole of the UK Armed Forces and partner nations, taking uh, ab initio uh, input right from entry into the three services and delivering them an output standard that allows them to go straight into operational conversion units and onto the front line. So here at RAF Cranwell, our stages are threefold. We take all of the uh, pilots in and deliver elementary flying training, which it takes someone who doesn't know how to fly an aircraft and teaches them the basic principles so that they can leave elementary flying training and go on to advanced flying training. Uh, they can either go to fast jets or rotary away from RAF Cranwell, but those who are going to onto multi-engine flying uh, do their advanced flying training here again on 3FTS on the Fenham aircraft. And then the final uh, third part of our uh, training is for those mission airborne and airborne specialists, those people who, who operate in the rear of our aircraft and provide essential services such as airload masters and uh, the I-STAR aspects of, of our rear crew. Our uh, partnership with uh, Ascent, our training service provider here on the uh, UK military flying training system, is absolutely essential. Effectively, they, they deliver the training uh, to our uh, military uh, standards and requirements. Uh, I support them in doing that. My military colleagues uh, help us keep the military part of, of military flying training system going. And then we're supported by, uh, by a whole force um, regular, reservist and contractor aircrew. Uh, contractors provide the aircraft such as uh, with affinity and civil servants are, are the final piece there making the whole system work and deliver the output that we need. EFT or elementary flying training provides trainee pilots who have little or no flying experience the foundation blocks to take on to the next stages of training, whether they're selected for rotary, multi-engine or fast jet streams. Flight Lieutenant James is a trainee pilot undergoing EFT at RAF Cranwell. We operate the Grob Prefect, which is a single engine uh, turboprop light aircraft. It's fully aerobatic, which allows us to do formation, low level flying, and navigation, um, all the way from elementary flying training through to lead in courses for fast jet and multi engine platforms. It's a, it's a fairly new aircraft to the RAF. Um, it's state of the art, uh, full glass cockpit um, with completely modern kit, um, which sets up students like myself better for the next stages of training, integrates with the, uh, the, the next platforms. The purpose of elementary flying training is taking men and women who have little or no flying training experience and providing the 
the basic skill set uh, to enable to operate safely and in a professional way at the next stage of the training. So the next stage would be either fast jet, multi-engine or rotary. We start with ground school, which is five weeks of ground-based training, learning from meteorology through to the what goes on behind the kit with radios uh, and the like. And then we move on to a shortened prefect tech course, which is a prefect specific ground school for a couple of weeks which leads then directly into the flying phase. The course runs in three distinct phases. The general handling, which takes us through the absolute basics, learning to roll, pitch, yaw the aircraft, use the power effectively, and then moving on through into um, developing that into dealing with emergencies and being able to fly circuits, for example. Um, the ultimate goal of, the, of that general handling phase is building up those basic flying skills in order to become competent enough to fly our first solo at the end of the, at the, end of the phase. From there, we move into the instrument flying phase, uh, which is learning to operate if the weather conditions deteriorate or in controlled airspace, whereby you are under the control of a controlling authority, air traffic control. Um, and primarily using the kit, um, so the, the glass cockpit that we've got in the prefect, using all of those instruments that are feeding into the aircraft to be able to fly safely without the visual cues that you'd usually have outside. From there, we move on to the navigation phase, uh, which is starts off using the, the traditional methods, map, um, clock, compass, and then slowly moves on to integrate the more modern kits, the GPS and uh, the and how that integrates with the kit um, in, the, in the prefect to be able to navigate safely and effectively um, ultimately being able to then operate in the future in that way. So th the stages of the training progress goes from ground school, the ground based training uh, in for five weeks into a prefect specific course and then moves into the flying phase comprised of three different stages of general handling, the basic blocks, the general uh, being able to fly the aircraft into instrument flying and then onto the navigation phase before culminating in our final navigation test at the end of the course. It's a shortened course uh, so I've done about 30 hours of flying throughout elementary flying training which sets us up for the next stages um, so if I go fast jet or multi-engine uh, I'd do a concurrent lead-in course which would top up the hours to what would become the equivalent of a private pilot's license um, and then we move on to uh, the, the next stage of training in our specific stream where we'll further develop those skills for the platform we'll ultimately end up flying. A former officer commanding 45 Squadron, Flight Lieutenant Rich is now a full-time reservist on 57 Squadron, teaching the RAF's future pilots to fly the Grob Prefect. 57 Squadron, our sole purpose is to train um, ab initio pilots on elementary flying training. So if you will, we take people who have come out of initial officer training and this is the first stage of the flying training journey. So we teach them how to fly from scratch and get them to a standard where they can subsequently be streamed either multi-engine, rotary or fast jet. We aim to get uh, between about 110 180 students uh, through the doors a, a year. Relatively new aircraft into RAF service, came in about two or three years ago. It's made by a German company called Grob and this is the Grob Prefect TP. Um, so it's a turboprop, that's what the TP stands for. So it's a state-of-the-art, what I'd call generation 4, generation 5 aircraft all glass cockpit and the whole purpose this was procured was to bridge the training gap so this is all glass and the purpose of an all glass cockpit as i said the aircraft they're going to go and fly albeit fast jet rotary or multi-engine pretty much on the front line all those aircraft are glass cockpits these days so they're used to do uh, doing that it's a carbon a sort of composite aircraft and um, if you if you will a sort of glass composite actually um, Absolutely stunning aircraft to fly. It's got a retractable undercarriage. And the good thing is we can do aerobatics in this aircraft. We can pull positive 6G, negative minus three. For those who are a bit unfamiliar with negative G, that's the feeling you get when you go over a bridge and your tummy almost comes upwards. So, an um, excellent lookout. Um, really good view on the canopy. Coming around then, um, for those who haven't flown before, we have elevators, rudders, Ailerons are the three uh, primary flying controls. Um, Anti-collision lights, pretty much get these on most of our aircraft. Um, very basic aircraft, we've got some winglets on, on this aircraft. Um, we've got um, a single structure flap and we have the ailerons on the out outside. We fly with what we call Jet A1 or um, 
aviation fuel, so jet fuel, just like the smell you get when you go to um, a civilian airport on your holidays. So coming up sort of into the cockpit, we've got four screens. We can duplicate everything on all those screens. So whatever the student is seeing, I am seeing. The good thing about having a side-by-side -side seating profile is for the initial stages of flying training, I can obviously watch the student like a hawk. I can see where they're looking. I can see where they're touching. The next stage of training, they'll fly in a cockpit where the qualified flying instructor sits behind the student and obviously there's a, a far more degree of trust there because obviously the instructor can't actually see what the student's doing but here it makes sense for the initial stage of flying training I can make any correction and particularly when we're teaching the fundamentals of good lookouts where we avoid other aircraft it's essential because I can obviously see if the student is looking out. Um, it's got flying controls are duplicated so they're both connected so whatever the student or input puts on the right hand seat, I can feel on the left hand seat. You've got two power levers, uh, we've got the students, so the student flies with their right hand and has a power lever in their left hand and that's effectively duplicated for me. I fly with a control column in my right hand and I've got um, another power lever on the left hand side. So that's how we fly in this aircraft. Hi, I'm Nigel Scopes, although everyone calls me Scopesy. Uh, I'm the Ascent Chief Pilot on the Fenham, so I'm one of the flying instructors on 45 Squadron here at RAF Cranwell, and our job is to train the next generation of multi-engine student pilots. This stage of the course for our students, they've completed their elementary flying training, so what we're all about now is advanced flying training, so we're the military um, multi-engine pilot training part of the pipeline. So here they learn for the first time how to fly in a multi-engine aircraft, but crucially also as part of a crew. So how they interact with the other members of their crew, be it on the flight deck or on the more, uh, on the larger aircraft types that the Air Force operate. They may have other mission crew perhaps also on the aircraft. So multi-engine, but also multi-crew training. That's what we're all about. The hardest thing that they're going to need to do is drawing everything together. All the things they've been taught up until now in their elementary flying training and as well as everything that we teach them. So operating this multi-engine aircraft as part of a crew. And now we're doing far more complex activities with them. They're in controlled airspace. They might be going to a, a major international airport or they might be operating at, at low level. Or in some sorties, we'll ask them to do all of those things together just to show that they've got all of those skills that they need to operate safely and effectively as part of a crew in a multi-engine aeroplane. So I'm standing in front of our Phenom aircraft. Uh, it's based on the Phenom 100, but uh, we call it the Phenom T Mark 1 now that we've introduced it into military service. And as you can see, it's a two-engine jet-powered aircraft. Um, it's capable of flight right the way through all of the types of airspace, both in the UK and overseas. And so for the first time, our students are operating firstly a jet aeroplane in itself, but also a multi-engine jet aircraft. So if we take a little look around on the outside of the aeroplane, it's not really designed for large passenger carrying, but there are four seats back in the cabin, so you can see the windows to the side as you'd expect to see on perhaps an executive jet, something like that. And we use those seats for training our mission air crew. It's not unusual for our student pilots to find that we've got mission air crew instructors and students in the cabin of the aircraft as we go flying. So a twin engine aircraft with the engines mounted high towards the rear of the aircraft, um, but don't worry, they're perfectly far enough apart so that if we were to simulate an engine failure, then the student knows all about it. So we'd teach them asymmetric flying right from the beginning of their training. Obviously, that's a very key skill, but uh, also don't worry, our engines are very reliable, so real engine failures are extremely unlikely. But the students are trained for that eventuality, should they ever need to. Um, it's bristling with a few aerials and the like because there's plenty of avionic equipment on this aircraft so that we can operate, as I say, globally in pretty much any classes of airspace as we go around. Uh, if we just continue around, some of the features that you might see on um, various aircraft of this type, it's also equipped with anti-icing systems. Um, so along the leading edge of the tailplane, and also when we get around again, the leading edges of the wings, that's actually fitted with inflatable, we call them boots, and that's literally what they do. They just inflate so that if any ice starts to build up on the aircraft, we can operate the switch on board in the flight deck, of course, and those boots literally inflate, and so the ice will literally break away from the airframe. So that's a slightly unusual feature, but one that's very valuable to us, allowing us to operate in all conditions. And once more, if we continue around, very obviously in uh, military Royal Air Force livery, 
these aircraft are actually military aeroplanes now. They're not just civilian aircraft that have had a bit of a paint job. So they are proper military registered aircraft um, with military registration numbers and all the rest of it. And around to the front here by the very familiar Royal Air Force Randall, of course, are the entrance steps. And this is the main access to and from the aircraft. Flight Lieutenant Alexander is a trainee pilot on 45 Squadron and is currently learning to fly the Phenom. I started on course a few months ago and I'm about halfway through what we call the general handling phase of the course at the moment, which is essentially welcome to a new aircraft, uh, one that you've never flown before, and let's see how the specific aircraft operates and then building upon the foundation that we laid during elementary flying training it's then teaching us how to fly an aircraft with multiple engines in situations that we've never flown in before so going into international airports and most importantly for the multi-crew side of it actually teaching us how to fly an aircraft with not only another pilot next to us but also mission crew behind us in a multi-crew and crew resource management scenario uh, so the aircraft is uh, an absolute beaut to fly um, generally she flies pretty similar to most other small aircraft, she's not a hugely large multi-engine aircraft but specifically she's got multiple engines so it can teach us things like asymmetric flight, critical engines and other of those aspects. Um, in terms of actually flying her, smooth, enjoyable and I'm very much looking forward to taking her low level specifically and seeing how she handles at 500 feet. RAF Valley is the home of UK fighter pilot training and Group Captain Andy Turk is the station commander. MFTS is the pipeline that takes students from phase one training, which is their initial entry into service, through to the frontline operational conversion units. Its joint mission statement is delivering a world-class military flying training system. For RAF Valley, our part of the pipeline, we deliver both fixed wing and rotary wing training with our main effort being getting pilots to the front line safely and on time. Wing Commander Chris. Welcome to 72 Fighter Squadron. I'm the officer commanding and here we conduct basic fast jet training for the Royal Air Force and Royal Navy pilots on the Texan T Mark 1. So we start them off in ground school so they get a good feel for the technical aspects of the aircraft. We put them in the simulator to teach them to handle emergencies and then we get them into the aircraft. This aircraft, the Texan, is good for minus three and a half G up to seven G. It's up to 316 knots, so much faster, higher performance than the aircraft they've come from. But like the Prefect, it's glass cockpit. It's got a very modern, advanced feel to it. Starting off with the basics, taking off, landing, circuit flying, we then introduce them to instrument flying so they can handle it in cloud. We'll visit the local airfields around the North Wales area uh, and into North England and then we get up to medium level where we start teaching them confidence, how to handle the aircraft near its limits, a stepping stone to being a fighter pilot. So how to stall the aircraft, how to spin the aircraft and recover it when it's out of control and how to do aerobatics not because we're going to display it or get the students to display it, but because this is a stepping stone to doing 1v1 combat. After that, we'll introduce them to low level navigation. And this uh, aircraft has got a fantastic navigation system. So we can very accurately find small targets and the students will have to simulate both bomb and gun attacks onto those targets. All the while in the back cockpit, the instructor is creating simulated uh, surface-to-air missile threats that the student has to respond to and still hit his or her target on time to the second. After that, we'll get them to fly together in formation, uh, both close formation so they can go through cloud and recover together and into tactical formations where they start to build the skills of providing cross cover to their wingmen or their flight lead. This all then culminates in the final phases of the course where we ask them to put together all those skills into a single sortie with a wingman, tactical environment, operating at its limits, sustaining 5G, building that G tolerance. And if they're successful on that final sortie, then they'll leave 72 Squadron with their pilot's wings. A proud moment for any uh, young trainee uh, fighter pilot in the Royal Air Force or Royal Navy.
My name is Fire Lieutenant Ollie, and I'm currently a student on 25 Fighter Squadron flying the Hawk T Mark II Advanced Fast Jet Trainer here at RAF Valley. The Hawk T Mark II has two seats. The instructor usually sits at the back and the student in the front. The aircraft can operate up to an altitude of 42,000 feet with a maximum speed of 550 knots um, at sea level and Mark 0.88 at height, which is approximately 88% of the speed of sound. The aeroplane is fully aerobatic and during the course uh, the students will perform a number of maximum performance manoeuvres. They will be able to recover the aeroplane from the stall, from the spin and conduct different uh, exercises. So let me talk to you a little bit about the course and what we do here on 25 Squadron. Uh, so during the course the students will start with the conversion phase. During the conversion phase the students will learn how to operate the aeroplane safely and effectively in all weather conditions. They will learn how to stall the aeroplane, they will learn how to recover it, spinning and recovering as well, and they will perform maximum performance manoeuvres. The MPMs, as we call them, are the prerequisite for the next phase, which is basic fighter manoeuvres, BFM, which is an essential skill of the fast, uh, fast jet pilots. On my previous aeroplane type, I flew the Tucano and I got approximately 110 hours of flying experience. And we, the students, feel that prepared us really, really well for the Hawk T2. The challenges of the Hawk T2 present themselves in the speed itself. As you can imagine, the performance of the aeroplane is much greater than anything that we've previously flown. Um, the big thing for us is the next event technique. So you constantly need to be thinking, what's, what's around the corner? What's going to happen next? If you're flying and you're thinking to yourself, I've got a spare couple of seconds, you're probably already behind the aeroplane. So you need to be constantly thinking ahead. The other thing we have to emphasize is the accuracy and how precise we need to be with this aeroplane. As you can imagine, things happen very very quickly so if you look away for a couple of seconds you may be not a couple of knots faster but considerably considerably faster and you can be off the height as well off the parameters so the accuracy is really really important at this stage of training just to build up a fundamental block for the future so before we uh, before we conduct the first flight in the aeroplane we do a number of flights in the simulator which prepares us really really well for any eventuality that may happen in the air especially any emergencies and how to conduct um, safe maneuvers to a good standard. So the first flight you do, you do pretty much everything yourself from starting the aeroplane to taking off, doing all the maneuvers and landing it yourself. So it really does prepare you really, really well for the first flight. Flight Lieutenant Alex and Flight Lieutenant Harry are from 4 Squadron. We've uh, recently just graduated 4 Squadron. Uh, preceding that, so the, the kind of workflow we go to, uh, to get onto 4 Squadron is you start on 25 Squadron, which is where you learn to fly the Hawk T2. Uh, you finish that course with learning to fly BFM, which is basic fighting maneuvers, and that is essentially dogfighting 1v1. And that's kind of the baseline of what you need to know before moving on to 4 Squadron. On 4 Squadron, you then start by going on to uh, using radars. So it's tactical intercepts on radars, and that's 1v1. So uh, you'll be uh, yourself against a hostile, picking him up on your radar system uh, and intercepting him uh, appropriately. From there, uh, you move on to the next stage, which is advanced combat maneuvers, uh, which is 2v1, so it's you and uh, another friendly fighter against a hostile to essentially defeat that aircraft as well. All right, from there then, we uh, build on the a ACM and we start to do more 2v1 and we build that uh, 2v1 ACM into 2v1 tactical intercepts. So again, we're still using the radar. Uh, we don't have a real radar, it's synthetic, uh, but it replicates a uh, radar pretty accurately. And um, we then fly as a two ship or a pair to uh, intercept a, uh, a hostile using the radar. And then again, we use that uh, 2v1 ACM to, uh, to defeat the hostile. Uh, from there we also do uh, air to surface profiles so we learn how to uh, drop munitions and uh, use the gun again all the uh, weapons are synthetic uh, but we get a uh, pretty good um, uh, symbology in the HUD of, uh, of what to expect when we hit the front line so it's uh, good training for that uh, again we do that as a pair especially for the uh, paveway uh, drops and then we also use the synthetic gun for strafing uh, the end of the course uh, accumulates in a couple of sorties where we try to use all the skills that we've learned on uh, 4 Squadron. So uh, that's called the op phase and again that is flown as a pair with your wingman. And we're looking to go out and uh, prosecute a, a weapons release. 
uh, and then uh, along that route we may uh, pick up a hostile on radar or get told that there's a, a hostile in the area by a uh, uh, synthetic uh, TAC uh, command and control unit. Uh, they'll f uh, direct us onto that uh, hostile and then we'll uh, intercept it and again use those uh, skills that we learned on 25 Squadron and 4 Squadron to uh, defeat it before uh, returning home. Uh, if that all goes well then uh, that should be the, uh, the end of the course and then from here we uh, graduate uh, 4 Squadron and uh, both of us are looking forward to flying Typhoon uh, 29 Squadron. The intensity and workflow as you go through flying training just increases and increases as you work through different aircraft moving from um, the Prefect onto the Texan and then onto the Hawk. Um, and with us culminating in the op, op phase at the end of 4 Squadron, you know, you're putting together everything you've learned over the, those multiple years preceding that um, into one big exercise which uh, simulates what you're going to be doing on the front line and it takes a lot of uh, mental capacity and preparation to be able to um, prosecute the targets and the uh, enemy aircraft uh, to the required standard. Uh, yeah, and as we progress through training, obviously the aircraft get uh, faster and faster, which means you get places quicker. Uh, that leaves you less time to uh, think about what you need to do, so you really need to be ahead of the jet uh, with anything that you're doing. The flying really needs to be second nature to uh, thinking about how to operate the aircraft and what you're going to do uh, when you get there. Uh, additionally, when we're flying um, intercepts against uh, hostiles, we're sort of head-to-head, -head, so the closure rate is even greater. Uh, which really compresses the timeline and uh, really gets the pressure going. Finally finished the course and being told uh, you're going to graduate from uh, fast jet training was such a relief and such a sense of achievement um, when it finally happened and just looking forward to the next stage and moving on to the front line. Uh, yeah, so getting down from that last op trip and uh, getting the sort of handshake of uh, you've passed the course was uh, a really good uh, experience. Uh, it's been a long time coming, uh, years in the making, so uh, it was it was a great relief and also really exciting because uh, that's the sort of last bit of training now before we uh, get onto the front line and uh, start doing what we've, uh, we've trained to do. I'm biased about the standards that we produce here but uh, you know I think we're very fortunate in the, in the UK. First of all the entry standard that we get is exceptional. Uh, we have a lot of people who are interested in joining the UK military in, in, in flying roles. Uh, we take the, the cream of those people who want to join. Uh, we give them the, the, some of the best training that there is in the world and the output standard I you know, genuinely believe is second to none. AC Victoria Andrews with a look back at some recent news from the RAF. The Royal Air Force has organised and led a large-scale air land integration exercise in Estonia to test the skills of NATO joint terminal attack controllers. Exercise Furious Wolf involved 38 controllers from 10 different nations currently serving with NATO in the Baltic region. The objective of the exercise was to enable the participants to train together and practice integrating aircraft with land components. ORAF Puma helicopters and personnel that formed the Toral Aviation Detachment in Afghanistan have returned to ORAF Benson after more than six years service in support of NATO operations. Operation Toral has been the UK's contribution to NATO resolute support in Afghanistan since the end of UK combat operations in 2015. The Chief of the Air Staff, Sir Mike Wigston, delivered an address as the withdrawal from Kabul took place. We can be very proud of all that we did to support the people of Afghanistan. We faced a ruthless enemy. I know that for some of you, your lives have changed forever for what you experienced. You were tested and you were not found wanting. So a heartfelt thank you to all those who served on or supported coalition operations in Afghanistan during this defining period in our history. For the second year running, the International Air Tattoo was held online. The six-hour live stream featured all new videos from the Royal Air Force and various air arms around the world, as well as new displays from virtual air festivals. You can watch it back by searching the Royal International Air Tattoo on YouTube or visit our Facebook page for links.
And finally, the RAF has been recognised as a top employer. It clinched the Company of the Year Award in the Rising Star Awards, being recognised for its active support and training of female talent and its work to ensure the next generation fulfil their potential. That's Reheat on Inside Air. I'm SAC Simon Ross with this episode's Name That Noise. That was the sound of a Hawk T1 from RAF Leeming in North Yorkshire. The Hawk T1 is a fully aerobatic, low-wing, transonic, two-seat training aircraft that is used in a number of roles for the RAF. 100 Squadron, based at RAF Leeming, fly the Hawk T1 in the aggressor role, simulating enemy forces and providing essential training to the RAF frontline units. In addition to this, the squadron carries out close air support training to British Army units, defence engagement tasks and participates in numerous overseas exercises throughout the year. The Hawk T1 is equipped to an operational standard and is capable of undertaking a war role. In the close air support training role, it can carry up to 8 3kg practice bombs. The Hawk T1 is set to be withdrawn from service with 100 Squadron by March 2022, but it will continue to serve with the Red Arrows until 2030. That's all for this episode of Inside Air. Please give us a review and subscribe on your favourite podcast app and join us again soon. You've been listening to Inside Air. A behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. If you're serving in the RAF and have a story for us, please speak to your unit media and communications officer. Inside Air is written and produced for the Royal Air Force by RAF Media Reserves.